Good afternoon and welcome to today's InShip lecture series. My name is Carrie Racian and I am the director of the Yukon Arm Center, which seeks solutions to reduce firearm related death and injury. Thank you for all being here today. I know it is snowing in New England, which has caused a few disruptions, but being able to still host Dr. Hinn and have you join us from wherever you may be is certainly an advantage of the virtual seminar. So today it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Marissa Henn. She currently serves as Deputy Commissioner at the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. And as New Hampshire's largest executive agency, they are guided by a mission to join communities and families in providing opportunities for residents to achieve health and independence. In this role, she leads cross-cutting strategic efforts to integrate policy and practice with a focus on supporting New Hampshire's most vulnerable individuals. In the past, she's also held roles in New York and Utah. And in fact, it was some of her work in Utah where I first learned about Dr. Hen. Here, she worked with her colleagues at Harvard to link data across the state of Utah to better understand suicide, firearm injury, and opportunities for prevention. But no matter where or what she's working on, Dr. Hen has spent the last 15 years working to try and put community needs and voices at the Center of Health and Human Service System Policy and Design. As you can see from the title of her presentation, I, we will look uh, forward to hearing more about that. As a matter of housekeeping, please use the chat if you have questions. Dr. Hen will present for about 45 minutes, and then at 1.15 p.m. or so, we will leave time for Q&A. Um, Dr. Hen is in New Hampshire, and if she loses power, we already have a backup plan. So just stick around, don't go anywhere, and she will rejoin us on the alternate system we have in place. Um, so Dr. Hen, we are so glad that you have joined us today, and I will turn it over to you and welcome. Great. Thank you so much, Carrie and team. It's uh, such an honor to be with you, and I'm just so grateful for the um, thoughtful and capable hosts who have brought us together um, on this snowy day. We have a, uh, about six inches and falling outside here in New Hampshire, and there's um, no uh, dialogue I'd rather be a part of on, on a day like this. Um, first, just to get the fine print out of the way, I should acknowledge that uh, the views expressed here are my own. Um, and are not reflective of any organization I've, I've been a part of. Um, and with that, uh, very excited to di dive into some, some information and, and most importantly, some discussion with you all. Um, and first, just wanna acknowledge um, some amazing entities that have uh, very much undergirded the, the work you're gonna hear about today. Um, one is the Johns Hopkins um, Center for Gun Violence Solutions. Um, which if you haven't had a chance to check out their US gun violence uh, in 2021 report, absolutely exceptional um, compilation of some of the most recent data we have available um, looking across uh, firearm deaths and providing key information around uh, demographic groups and equity issues. Um, and I'll be borrowing uh, generously and citing them as I go through. Um, I also want to just express my huge gratitude to colleagues at the Harvard Injury Control Research Center, in particular, Kathy Barber, um, the head of their Means Matter campaign, who have, who have really taught me everything I know about this subject. Um, and acknowledge um, the many researchers out there, um, Carrie and the Arm Center included, that are scraping by on small budgets and huge skill and passion to, to engage in this work so that people who lean more on the applied practice policy side, like myself, can be informed and motivated by um, data to, to advance, hopefully, some positive change. So I want to open by, um, you know, kind of describing how I got uh, involved in this, this issue of suicide and fire, firearm suicide in particular. Um, so the picture at the bottom is actually not the place I expected to be doing my dissertation work, um, but it turned out to be a really important place. It was, this is actually a, um, a shooting range in Salt Lake City. And um, I'm pictured here talking with uh, the leading gun lobbyist for the state of Utah, um, a gentleman named Clark Apotion. Um, again, shooting range, it's also a gun shop, not uh, an expected place, but it turned out to be a very important place to me. Um, as I was in Utah working on my dissertation, which looked at public health approaches to suicide in the US, and so just to talk about that a little bit, situating us around this public health challenge, um, suicide was first framed as a public health issue in the mid-1990s. 
uh, as a variety of private foundations and other um, private public partnerships started launching. The first public suicide prevention conference was held. And in 1999, Surgeon General David Satcher issued the first ever call to action demanding that the U.S. address suicide as a significant public health problem. Um, so a lot of work followed. Um, by the early 2000s, uh, there was a national strategy for suicide prevention, and almost all states uh, developed their own aligned statewide plans. They hired suicide prevention coordinators. And yet, here I was arriving in Utah um, in 2016, and the suicide rate had been steadily rising since that time it was declared a, a crisis. Um, Utah uh, at that time and still has one of the highest rates of suicide in the country. And when I arrived there, one of the things that surprised me was that one of the groups that was most eager for data weren't necessarily the doctors and nurses and social scientists and policymakers we were assigned to meet with, but were actually gun enthusiasts, Second Amendment advocates. They had been hit particularly hard by the issue of suicide. And I would say of the many dozens of gun owners I came to know in the following years, I never met one who hadn't lost a friend or relative to suicide. So over time, and as I'll talk about today, I came to recognize that dialogue with the gun community wasn't just possible, it was actually going to be essential if we will address this public health problem that is being driven more and more by differential access to firearms, more than it is by differential diagnosis of mental health conditions. So to talk a little bit more about suicide in the US, um, this again is, this is 2021 data from the CDC, um, suicides are one of the main drivers of the decline in U.S. life expectancy. Um, for the third straight year, we've seen a drop, obviously affected by other factors, including COVID, but deaths of despair, including suicide, are um, one of the main um, components. About 45,000 people die by suicide each year in the U.S. Um, and we, just to familiarize yourself with this as we go through the presentation, suicide is measured as the number of deaths per 100,000 people. Um, and so the U.S. suicide rate in 2021, when the most recent federal data is available, was 14 per 100,000 people. So it's a leading cause of death, but it's also in some ways relatively rare, hence why we have to measure it in per 100,000 people. So rates of suicide have fluctuated. This is not actually necessarily the highest it's ever been. Um, rates were pretty high in the 1970s and 80s. Um, there was declining rates in the 1990s and then a very steep increase beginning in about 1999 through the present. Generally, when um, we talk about suicide, uh, most researchers agree that there are no singular causes of suicide. It's a multifactorial phenomenon. So generally, uh, we explain that suicide risk arises through the interaction of risk factors that are thought to increase the likelihood of suicidal behavior and protective factors which are thought to decrease the likelihood of suicidal behavior. And those risk and protective factors are interacting across multiple levels, individual, relationship, community, society. So some of the risk factors um, would include things like mental health or behavioral health issues, family history of suicide, stigma, socioeconomic factors. Um, protective factors would include things like mental health treatment, family and community support, and spiritual views and cultural beliefs that discourage suicide. So something that you uh, that we'll get into in depth here today is talking about method. Um, so as you can see, firearms are the most common method of suicide, followed by suffocation, which suffocation includes um, hanging. Uh, as, and then that's followed by poisoning, which includes um, intentional overdose. Uh, and so, so that's a really important fact to, to start with. If you flip that around, so we were just looking at what, you know, what proportion of suicides are by method, but also what proportion of gun deaths are suicides. It's worth noting that the majority, about 54% uh, um, of gun deaths in the U.S. in 2021 were suicides. Um, the remainder were mostly homicides. Um, in states like Utah, where I worked previously, and New Hampshire, where I work currently, it's actually a much larger proportion of gun deaths that are suicides. Um, closer to 85 to 90 percent of all gun deaths are suicides. 
And that has been a really important um, wake up call to many people when it comes to the common ground efforts I'm going to talk about here today. So one of the sources of data that I often use to kind of introduce why it is that that means matter um, comes from a study by Matt Miller um, and his team at uh, Harvard and Northeastern. And they did this really interesting study where they grouped two, um, two sets of states, states with the highest um, average household gun ownership, so homes that have one or more gun on average, and the states that have the lowest average household gun ownership. So, um, so group those states together. They ended up by design having about the same population. So about 39, 40 million people in each of the high gun and the low gun cohorts. What was interesting, and, and obviously by definition, the high gun states uh, had high gun ownership. So close to half of those homes um, uh, had at least one firearm. And in the low gun states, closer to 15%. So what was interesting and what makes this point about why means do matter is that the number of suicides in those states during their, their period they looked at, um, the number of non-firearm suicides were roughly the same, about 5,000 or so suicides by methods other than firearm. Where the difference in suicide number and rate um, occurred was in that grouping of firearm suicides. And that accounted for the overall difference between the two states. And this, you can you can replicate this work in a lot of ways. We actually did it in the state of Utah with um, counties that have um, low rates of gun ownership versus high rates, and it is consistent. So um, where there are more guns, there are more gun suicides. And that is what is really um, reflecting the, the this most significant disparity in um, suicide rate between high gun and low gun states. It's not that states with more guns are more um, mentally ill. It is that there are uh, highly lethal um, methods available in the context of a life crisis. Um, and so just to, you know, to think about that point, you see that if, if I were to, and I didn't have time to do this, but I dreamed of uh, superimposing on this um, visual um, a uh, rate of gun ownership, household gun ownership, you would see a very close alignment and correlation between the number, or I should say the rate of gun suicide um, in, in, uh, that, are, that are occurring in states with high um, rates of gun ownership. So let's talk a little bit about some of the populations that are most um, impacted uh, by, by gun suicide. So obviously, if you're in a state with high uh, ownership of guns, that's, that's a disproportionately impacted population. Um, the highest rates of suicide are among U.S., uh, in the U.S., are among males who are white or American Indian um, and who are over age 65. And so you see that reflected here, that while the national average um, suicide rate is between 5 and 10 percent, it's four times that for white males, um, 65 plus. And th this I found quite powerful. This was again in the Hopkins 2021 report. We saw the suicide rate go up slightly. Fortunately, it didn't go up nearly as high as some of us feared during kind of the, the first years of COVID. Um, but what is interesting is that the rise that did occur during that time from 2019 to 2021 um, the rise in suicide overall was entirely in that category of gun suicide. Um, so we're so we're again, you know, seeing a, a huge impact of firearm access when it comes to this challenge, uh, whereas the non gun suicide rate is remaining relatively flat uh, across time and space. Um, another thing that was very concerning uh, during the sort of COVID and now post COVID, if you will, or whatever phase we're in period has been some of the changing demographics. Um, so one of the things that we have seen is that there has been a startling increase in gun deaths, um, including gun suicide, among non-white groups. Um, so you see the, the, gain, the increases in gun suicide rate by, um, in particular, the American Indian Alaska Native and Black populations um, in the US. So something we can talk about more in the discussion, there was a lot of attention paid to that uh, many people purchased guns during COVID. Um, and it, it appears that some of that was disproportionately occurring in, um, in non-white communities. 
So now that I've depressed you with all the um, stats about what a huge public health problem we have, um, I do want to give you the sort of hope and change oriented part of this uh, of this conversation, um, which is that those of us who are steeped in this data um, believe that there is a way out of this. Um, and one of the, the key elements is what we call lethal means reduction, meaning how do we put time and distance and other barriers between a person who has a suicidal impulse and a highly lethal method? So this approach called means reduction is one of a limited number of empirically based high impact suicide prevention strategies. So if you go and read the meta reviews on all of the strategies to prevent suicide from training of teachers and coaches to um, increase in mental health treatment, there's lots of really good stuff we should do for lots of different reasons. But um, one of the only ones that is known to move the dial on suicide internationally is lethal means reduction. Um, and international evidence shows that when you reduce widely used and highly lethal means, um, suicide rates decline 30 to 50 percent. And that's been true um, when it comes to the country of Sri Lanka, when the toxicity of the most common pesticides used in suicides um, were, were eliminated. Um, it is true in England around changing the toxicity of domestic gas. Um, it's been true in countries, including Israel, when it comes to reduced um, access to firearms when people are no longer um, in service or on base. So, so it's 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 a really important strategy, and and yet has been slow to be adopted in the United States. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why this strategy um, actually works, because uh, that's important to understand if we're going to leverage some of this into um, additional uh, policy practice and and research. So the reason why um, the reason why lethal means works is be first because many suicide attempts are occurring with very little planning. Um, so an interesting study was done by um, Dysonheimer in which they asked people who had um, a, had very suicide very serious suicide attempts. You know how how long was it between when you started kind of planning that um, attempt and when you took action? So some people may have experienced chronic suicidality, but from the moment you said, I'm going to do this to the moment you took action, how long transpired? And it turns out that about half of people um, had less than a 10 minute period between the decision to um, make an attempt and the actual attempt. Um, even for very serious um, attempts that occurred. So a very little period of planning, oftentimes in the context of a life crisis or relationship breakup um, or other news that, that floods the, the brain um, that this is occurring. The second is that method really matters when it comes to just how fatal firearms are. Um, we try not to advertise this data in all venues because it's... Uh, we want to be we want to be careful about people who are who are contemplating suicide where this might go but it's worth noting that the case fatality ratio the proportion of people who will make an attempt using a certain method and the proportion who die is incomparable when you look at guns versus other methods so we're talking um roughly 80 to 85 percent of attempts with a gun will result in a death compared to um one to two percent case fatality um, rate with um, sharps or overdose so there's not time to change your mind. There's not time to be rescued. Um, firearms are very um, lethal, and uh, and that is a huge challenge as well. Um, and then the, fi the final reason I, I like to highlight about why lethal means reduction works is that contrary to sort of popular belief, um, it's generally not true that people will find another way. Um, the research indicates that over 90% of people who attempt suicide and survive will never go on to die by suicide later in their lives. So if you can get people through this um, period of escalated psychological crisis, um, you can hopefully get them resources and, and ensure that recovery is the norm that those of us who work in this field know that it is. So if you can save a life in the short term, you can save a life for good. And unfortunately, the um, introduction of firearms in that crisis period often is what stands between us and, um, and the survival and uh, recovery that, that most people experience. So now I'm going to get into the more kind of applied side of this. And, and this, uh, as, as someone who spends time as a deputy commissioner and, and policy person, um, this is where I tend to engage the most. I benefit from the research of, of brilliant colleagues and centers and then think, OK, so, so how do we make this concept come alive in practice? Um, 
So the first thing I'll say is that there's been some really exciting and important work happening in healthcare environments. Um, one study in particular that uh, that I've been following is one in which counseling and providing um, locking methods to parents who have suicidal youth is um, is resulting in a high uh, proportion of those parents changing their behaviors. So um, among gun owning parents of suicidal youth who visited an emergency department, one third had unlocked guns um, in in this uh, running at all study, and by um, the follow-up that, that was done months later, none of them had unlocked firearms. I think where I've tended to be a little bit critical, both as someone who spent time inside and adjacent to healthcare systems, is recognizing that in general, if you look at the history of public health um, challenges and successes, rarely do victories come from engagement in healthcare settings alone. Um, and I think COVID is probably one of many. We could together probably come up with a long list of of other examples of um, challenges that when they stay within healthcare environments are not going to reach the full potential of population um, health and population behavior change. And to that end, the most recent Surgeon General's national strategy goes out of its way to point out that we really need to partner with firearm owners themselves if we're going to change behaviors and advance a lethal means reduction framework. I think, and, and I worked on a paper with Kathy Barber and David Hemingway at the Harvard Injury Control Research Center on this. I think I wanna highlight a few things that need to be considered as we look to move beyond clinical environments into more community-based ones in the way that I think the Surgeon General was talking about. Um, the first is that guns are controversial here. Um, engaging in conversation around them in in variety of settings, healthcare and otherwise, can be seen as somewhat taboo. And that comes on top of a certain stigma and taboo that suicide already occupies. So that's one of the um, considerations and I think reasons why it's been a little harder to advance some of the firearm suicide prevention efforts that we know would work. Um, the other is that I think if people are only beginning to realize that the political and moral and other views of gun owners actually can align with the principles of suicide prevention. Um, something I often have encountered, and maybe some of you are thinking it right now, is, you know, how can you really work with gun owners on this when their worldview is counter to elements of prevention or um, harm reduction? And what I have found is that's actually not the case at all. Um, and in fact, firearm suicide prevention is um, a uh, can be advanced in a Second Amendment friendly way that is not seen as anti-gun in the way that most people initially um, think that it is. But I think that assumption has slowed some of the adoption of the approaches that we're talking about today. Um, the second thing I think is important when we think about broader, wider scale adoption of some of the efforts that I'll be getting into more depth about in a minute is that if you want to have messages stick, if there's nothing else we learned from COVID, it's that those messages need to be really crafted, um, appropriate to the populations that are receiving them and conveyed by messengers that have trust within the communities that we hope to accept them. Um, and uh, Marino et al. did a couple of really interesting studies on this showing that rural gun owners who received messages that were um, respectful of their gun rights were more likely to take actions such as babysitting a friend's guns or, um, or other elements of lethal means reduction. And that um, messages that come from a non-trusted source, probably people in health and human service departments like me, um, were sometimes perceived as being potentially threatening and antagonistic. So, so really important, if we, if we just forget um, your beliefs and attitudes about guns, if we want messages to permeate and lead to behavior change, we need to be laser focused on, on who's crafting and who's um, spreading the message. Um, I now want to get into a little bit more hands-on around, um, based on my experiences here in New Hampshire and previously in Utah, a little bit about what we have done um, to, to take this work to the next level and to do so in, in collaboration with gun owners. Um, so here in New Hampshire, um, which in some ways was one of the first states to really, uh, to really get this work off the ground, in 2009, um, a terrible tragedy occurred where there were three unrelated suicides that occurred in one week um, that had no connection to one another, except for the fact that each person died by suicide hours after buying a gun from the same store. 
So one week, three suicides, no connection other than each of them had purchased a gun from the same store. Um, and so this was a wake up call for the um, for the gun community, for the public health community here in New Hampshire. And a really important organizing effort came out of this where a group formed called the New Hampshire Gunshot Project. Um, and working with the Harvard Injury Control Research Center, they designed material, um, posters and brochures that were intended to help people who sell guns to avoid selling to people in suicidal crisis. So the idea here was you have a very captive audience of gun sellers and gun range owners and a lot of those stores here in New Hampshire, the live free or die state, um, those gun owners didn't, the last thing they wanted was to sell a firearm to someone whose um, reason for purchasing was to harm themselves. And so by helping them identify risk factors and by doing that education, um, the idea was to um, help uh, to help prevent suicides. And so um, obviously we can't, it's very hard to measure the actual efficacy in terms of lives saved. Uh, we can talk more about that from a research standpoint later. But what we do know is that um, this was evaluated six months after launch. And um, six months later, 48% uh, of the retailers were still displaying the campaign materials in their stores. Um, and there was a high correlation between the dealer's belief in lethal means reduction as a concept and his or her support of the campaign. So I think what this showed us is that there's really a willingness to, um, to adopt and engage in this paradigm but it takes time. It takes relationships. It takes um, it takes building that trust together. And in this case, I think it took a sort of catalytic event to help people understand just why it was worth coming together in that way. Um, so in the state of Utah, I was fortunate to be part of a, a similar coalition as the New Hampshire Gunshot Project that was focused on gun safety and suicide prevention and included gun owners as a key um, key part of its membership. So we modeled ourselves very much on the New Hampshire approach. Um, and you know, I think it's worth pausing to say that finding common ground sort of sounds nice and it is really special and it's also very hard. Um, there's something very unexpected and very paradoxical about public health people and gun people coming together because most people assume that the two groups have opposite interests in mind relative to gun deaths. Um, and because the reality of suicide being driven by access to firearms is a very new concept um, for most of us. But this group really premised itself on the idea of open dialogue, feeling, as I said in my opening, that it wasn't only possible, but it was necessary if we were going to see change in a state with such high rates of gun death and particularly suicide gun death. Um, so I want to talk for a second um, going back to that picture with the gun lobbyist who I got to know very, very well and keep in very close touch with, um, a little bit about the beliefs underlying this work and why this partnership worked. Um, you know, for some of us, including Clark, the gun lobbyist, um, guns are, per are symbols of personal freedom. For others of us, guns are symbols of violence. Um, for some, gun regulations are seen as limiting freedom, whereas for others of us, gun regulations are seen as increasing safety. For some, guns are seen as really essential to personal safety, whereas the opposite is true in, in other groups. Um, gun, gun rights advocates generally see guns as mostly beneficial and in fact related to a constitutional right, or I should say as a constitutional right. and folks more aligned um, in their history and background and sociocultural orientation to gun control feel that gun violence is actually diminishing their, their personal liberties and presenting mostly harm. So the point here isn't for us to, you know, apply, a, you know, a, try to try to work out the debate, um, so to speak, but, but to acknowledge that there's something powerful about getting to know the other's belief system um, and and also recognizing that while we want to understand, we don't have to agree with all those things in order to engage in, in public health change together. Um, I think the really big headline here in yellow at the top is there's a common denominator, which is that all of us want our loved ones to be safe. And all of us in states like New Hampshire and Utah are horrified that 90% of gun deaths are suicides. And, and, in, and many would say are preventable by nature of, of that. So the group in Utah I was a part of, the groups here in New Hampshire, um, orient around a common goal, 
um, similar to the way that shifts in drunk driving social norms didn't require all out bans on, on alcohol or on cars. The idea here is to voluntarily put space and time between a suicidal impulse and a gun framed in that same way of friends don't let friends drive drunk as a preventive rather than a prohibited uh, prohibitive strategy. So it's this subtle shift in framing that um, that can open the door to, to changes in dialogue and behavior. Um, I'm gonna talk about some of the things that we did in Utah and that are continuing um, quite vibrantly since I left. Um, so one of the big areas we focused was on clinical training. Um, so with support and with significant feedback from gun owners, uh, during the course of about three years, we trained several thousand health professionals, which included um, doctors and nurses, but also social workers and mental health techs, um, to engage in a brief counseling intervention to reduce access to lethal means for um, patients. And so uh, this was mimicked, as I said, on some of the work that was done um, in Colorado, which, uh, which also um, uh, disseminated lock boxes or gun locks, but, uh, but it's often referred to as COM, counseling on access to lethal means. The second thing, and apparently this is actually how, um, how UConn found, uh, found me, is epidemiological research. So believe it or not, Utah, one of the most um, gun-friendly uh, states in the country, um, in 2017 passed a bill that called for a suicide prevention and gun study um, and that used a really innovative um, data matching approach uh, that uh, allowed us to learn a great deal more about what was happening when it came to suicides and firearm suicides in Utah. Um, this bill and the funding attached to it would have never passed without gun owners joining us in um, calling for it. Um, but fortunately, they did join us and then were also part of our research advisory group to inform and then help us um, translate the findings to the real world. And so I'll give just one example. Like one of the things we didn't know prior to the study is that um, most gun suicides in rural counties in Utah were by long gun. So most people had assumed that, that you know, the firearm that was leaning against their door uh, for safety and in a rural community was not the one that would ever be involved in a suicide. And that turned out to not be the case when we did data matching um, at a population scale. So, so that really changed suddenly just distributing small handgun lock boxes or um, locking devices wasn't adequate. Um, we needed to engage in a different level of prevention dialogue with rural communities. So that was one of many, many um, takeaways from that research that allowed us to be very locally tailored in the data that we collected and used. Um, we did a lot with firearm curricula. Um, at the time, actually, Utah has now moved to uh, abolishing um, concealed carry, so not quite as relevant anymore. But at the time, all people who wanted a concealed carry permit in the state had to take a course. And so we made sure that that course was infused with a component, a module that focused on um, lethal means reduction and uh, and was informed by gun owners. And we got a high level of support. About 80% of the instructors were, were highly supportive of and engaged in the module. Um, and then some other things that went on included uh, a focus on safe storage. So Utah has something called the Safe Harbor Law where gun owners or people who live with them can store firearms free of charge if they're going through a tough time. So the idea here is, you know, you're going through a divorce or your child is, um, you know, learning how to manage their anxiety or depression, we need guns out of the home during this time and sort of a voluntary method. It, it hasn't gotten huge take up, no surprise, but the fact that it does exist for those families who need it um, makes it worthwhile. And it's also just an important talking point um, for introducing the concept and the norm of, um, of safe gun storage. Um, and then finally, and you see a picture of this on the screen, um, a really cool thing that Utah did was uh, dedicated a lot of resources to a social norms campaign, basically uh, billboards and radio ads, and that was well evaluated and really designed to, um, to help people uh, understand the norm of safe gun storage, as well as other help seeking behaviors. And so, um, so this was, was also important um, in terms of widespread public awareness of lethal means reduction. I think the area that I've been most interested and has been most challenging has been the legislative arena. 
Um, so this is uh, Clark and I arguing about something on his gun talk radio show um, one day. But one of the ideas that he and I often would discuss and discuss with our respective groups was could we could we do stuff in terms of gun bills, um, things like red flag laws or ERPOs, which it turned out got controversial very quickly. Um, so that one was sort of off the table. But one that we decided to take up as a coalition was something that had been passed in the state of Washington around um, allowing people to voluntarily add themselves to a no buy list. So the idea here would be that someone who, say, you know, just had their first diagnosis or hospitalization for something like bipolar disorder or another um, condition could recognize, you know, in the future, I may experience episodes where I it's not safe for me to have access to purchasing or possessing a firearm. I'm going to add myself to a list to um, create another barrier between uh, myself and access to a gun. Um, and so this is something, as I said, Washington State was the first to debut it. I think Virginia was second. Um, and as it turned out, we in Utah, through a lot of deep work and collaboration and debate and groundwork, um, managed to be the, the third state um, that passed it. Um, what made, I think, Utah kind of different is that no state um, before and really since ever managed to do it with the full support of Second Amendment advocates. Um, as you can see from this headline, it was definitely not a place that we expected to be passing bills together, and um, and uh, and yet we managed to do that. Um, so that's kind of an interesting case study. And I think um, I recently was asked, like, what were some of the ingredients for doing that? And of course, it wasn't just Clark and me; it was many people. And you know, a couple of the things that stood out for me is. Just that you have to, this is kind of slow, hard work. Like it's more than putting together a concept paper or a well-written policy. Um, there was a lot of work and um, that had to go into building trust around the concept in the first place. Um, it needed to be framed in a way that really respected pro-gun values. So much as we public health people wanted to foreground data and foreground our life-saving measures, like it, it really needed to be from the perspective of a, a gun owner, him or herself. Um, it needed to focus on temporary safety. So much as, uh, you know, some of us would prefer that it be long-term safety, meaning like, why do we even need perhaps, you know, people who are at risk to have access at all? Um, this notion of temporary and voluntary were key, key concepts. We needed to re re um, respect the sacrifice that gun owners were making by even um, reducing their access temporarily. Um, we also had to emphasize privacy and confidentiality. It turns out the Second Amendment community in Utah, anyway, was deeply concerned about, you know, records and their information being um, uh, saved and sent elsewhere. And so emphasizing even just how records will be deleted after what period of time was, was essential to building that trust. Um, from a value standpoint, as I said, um, being suicide, le lethal means reduction is not anti-gun, and we needed to make that clear by building on gun owners' values of family protection and safety and self-reliance, which um, have always uh, been, been core to the common ground work we've done together. And as I said, with the friends don't let friends drive drunk, really saying this isn't about prohibitions and bans and mandates, this is about prevention. Just as you would take your keys from a buddy at the bar who's been having one too many, um, this is about taking smart steps to live safer with things that can cause harm. So as I wrap up and as we um, hopefully have some, some good time, yeah, it looks like we will have some great time for discussion. Um, I, I, I really think a lot in my work about this idea of um, who is not at the table. Um, and I think for a long time in, um, in public health, we've been slow to kind of recognize that the beneficiaries, the, the, the folks we hope will be targets of, uh, recipients of, whatever, choose your, your um, descriptor, um, will just sort of take up what's best um, out of um, some, some, you know, uh, a pragmatic desire to be healthier. And I think, in truth, um, in the world we're living in, with the amount of political vitriol and um, sort of polemic politics that we find ourselves, um, that passive adoption of sort of doing the right thing generally has, doesn't work. Um, so while there are many things in, in public health that we try to do without anyone noticing, um, one of my public health mentors, uh, David, 
Betancourt uh, at the Harvard Injury Control Research Center wrote a book called While You Were Sleeping. And it's literally like all the things we do to make roads and make food and make water, you know, things you never think about, but make it very easy to be healthy. When it comes to gun safety, um, I'm not sure we have that same luxury of, of just kind of hoping for the best. Um, so Arlene Hauschild wrote a, a great book about um, conservatives in Louisiana during the 2016 election. And one of the lines that stood out to me as I was engaging in this work with gun owners over the last um, bunch of years was this passage. She said, we on both sides wrongly imagine that empathy with the other side brings an end to clear headed analysis when in truth, it's on the other side of the bridge that the most important analysis can begin. Um, and this has definitely proven to be the case. I would, you know, it's solely relying on regulations um, and the enactment and enforcement of regulations to prevent gun suicides is very unlikely to work in states like New Hampshire and Utah due to the fact that guns are so popular and so available here. Um, and so my belief based on the data and based on my own experience is that if we want to mitigate um, gun violence, uh, we should also engage firearm enthusiasts in very candid dialogues about uh, lethal means reduction. Um, and that data and policies really aren't enough. We need to actually engage with people who are positioned to inform and lead change and who are actually very hungry for data around issues that are affecting their population um, disproportionately. Um, and then finally, as I've said throughout this presentation, that that can be done in concert with, as opposed to in, in um, opposition to their underlying values of friends helping friends and um, preventing unintended shootings and self-reliance and so forth. So public health goals and the goals of gun owners actually can share many common values. Um, and then uh, finally, I, I included a picture, one of my favorite pictures on the road in Utah. Um, I actually saw posters like this all the time, and I've seen a few in New Hampshire too, of raffling off um, uh, firearms uh, as part of a Little League fundraiser. Not something that I'd <laughs> maybe maybe is going on in Connecticut, but but maybe uh, maybe I'm wrong about that. But the point in here again is that if we if we only um, take a regulatory approach to this challenge. Um, we're, it's what um, uh, Heifetz, the, Ron Heifetz, who's the leader of the adaptive leadership model, it's what's called a, a, a tame solution to a, to a complex or wicked problem. It's, it's, it makes sense on one hand, but it's not going to be adequate to meet the complexity of the, the challenge as a whole. Um, we also need to work with and learn how to engage with um, people who are even better positioned to um, to shift behaviors and advance um, life-saving messages. So I am going to stop there, and I am super interested in your feedback, questions, um, critiques, et cetera. And I think I will. Um, it's OK. I'll uh, just uh, close my slides so we can see each other. That'd be great. Thank you, um, Dr. Hen. That was, that was outstanding and thought-provoking. Um, so for folks that are interested in asking questions, I have one in the chat, which I will read. You can pop your questions there. You can also turn off your camera and come on and um, we'll, you know, uh, raise your hand and we'll recognize everyone and, and you can ask Dr. Hen your question. So uh, I'm going to start with one from Sarah. She says, thank you for this insightful presentation. This continues to highlight the need for gun safety measures, especially regarding suicide prevention and mental health awareness. I'm curious to know if there is still un underrepresented data. Oh, sorry, I just lost my place on that. On black and brown populations regarding firearm suicide rates, because perhaps these communities are hesitant to report these numbers, especially given that our community's mental health and suicide awareness continues to be a cultural stigma. Yeah, great question and and points. Um, I would say in the public health. Um, literature that I've seen, I'd say one of the most um, alarming uh, sources of data, if we take that at, for what it's worth, has been the dramatic rise in suicide, particularly among young Black men. Um, and there's some really important um, work that's gone on that I can um, try to uh, maybe even pop in the chat before this is over. But 
um, but the the rates there have been much higher. I think it's a really interesting point that's being raised around even reporting and um, you know is there are, 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 is there information perhaps that's being withheld when it comes to death data generally we have pretty reliable data because it's relying on medical examiner reports when a suicide occurs um, thanks to many, public health heroes, uh, including some of the ones I've mentioned, like Kathy Barber and David Hemingway, the National Violent Death Reporting System, NVDRS, allows, um, allows us to collect and analyze data um, at a much more granular level, obviously still hindered by some of the limitations of how, um, of how uh, race and class and um, ethnicity are, are categorized in our census system. But I think the big picture here is there's definitely something changing and whether it's, um, and I don't think we know why, um, is it impacted by changing um, issues of prevalence and incidence of mental illness and the lack of access to services? Is it due to black and brown communities purchasing firearms at a higher rate during and um, since the COVID period? So I think, I think those are some areas that we need a lot more input. And when it comes to change, the work I'm talking about um, has been in mostly white states, which isn't to say that there isn't um, uh, an equity orientation to it, but um, I'm not sure the methods that I talked about are as applicable in in settings that are that are um, uh, include more black and brown people. Thank you. And from Kim, we have some states have red flag laws, re gun access in situations of domestic abuse and or mental health concerns. Is there data showing that these work? Great question. So, by the way, there was an inship lecture. Um, oh, I'm going to block on his name, but maybe someone can prompt me that was on this very topic about red flag laws. So, um, so go back and check the YouTube archives for that. Um, so, if someone remembers maybe the name of the person or the date, you can pop it into to the chat or, or mention it here. But but there are some um, promising results actually, in particular, coming from from Connecticut and Indiana showing that um, I believe it's for every 10 to 20 um, times that firearms are removed from the home of someone who's believed to be a risk to themselves or others, um, one suicide was averted. Um, and so I think Connecticut is actually really has had some of the longest standing and best um, analysis of this issue. Um, there are now um, six states where I think evaluations are ongoing around the extreme risk protection orders. Um, but a lot more research is needed around their effectiveness. I mean, what I will say, both Utah and New Hampshire, it's the bills come up every session and they've been sort of a non-starter. In my personal experience, um, I have had many gun owners and gun advocates tell me they think it's a good idea and that it's just become kind of the slippery slope policy du jour. Like it's just not, it is one that got grouped a little too much um, in a category of like, we're not, we're just not going there. So I'm hoping that'll change. It seems like a lot of states are um, rename, renaming, relabeling, reapproaching it. But um, unfortunately, by I'd say 2017, 2018, um, even the gun advocates who were very willing to pass safe storage laws and the voluntary um, no buy list that I talked about were were in, in, in private conversation describing an openness to it and in publicly. Um, Absolutely no way. So we'll see if that changes over time, particularly as the research becomes more compelling around um, how much of a difference they're making. Thank you. Um, oh, great, and they did pop. It looks like, um, thank you so much, Josh. Uh, he included the lecture by Ali um, Rowani uh, Rabar, that Dr. Um, Rabar, that is on YouTube and um, definitely encourage checking that out if you wanna learn more about ERPO and the current evidence. Um, and we will send this out at the end. Um, he is from the University of Washington and, um, and a great speaker. Um, so Bill uh, asks, says, thank you, Marissa, for the many comments about the importance of having respect for firearm owners and working towards solutions to prevent suicide. I am with the Trade Association for the Firearms Industry in SSF and also a member of the Connecticut Suicide Advisory Board, an example of openness um, to firearm community input. Also, NSSF partners with AFSP and VA on suicide prevention. Yes, um, definitely. Yeah, the National Shooting Sports Foundation um, has been a really important partner. It's not been without controversy. I will say I went to 
plenty of conferences where there was debate and discussion. Um, overall, I think it's fantastic. I think it's good that that discussion is happening. And I will also mention NSSF has donated so much in terms of locking devices and other materials that are really important, including in clinical and community settings um, for having that conversation so that you're not just um, engaging with a patient or a friend, but you're actually able to hand them a gun lock or um, or some sort of uh, device that that both is practical, but also memorializes the conversation. So I think it's been neat to see the ways the American Suicide Prevention um, community and NSSF have partnered, and I think it's um, it's going to continue to um, really inform this common ground work across the states. Yes, and I sit with Bill on some of those committees. He is indeed a great partner. Um, so uh, Barbara asks or says, "Thank you for this presentation. How do we heighten awareness and education without promoting copycats?" And I, I even think you alluded to some of this in the not wanting to highlight that firearms can be a very effective means of suicide relative to other means? Yeah, no, that's a great, um, it's a great question. I mean, I think in general, the only part of the presentation that we, like, I wouldn't share with a youth audience or um, sort of a less scholarly audience, I guess, is just the part about um, the, the um, case fatality rate of different means. I think everything else is, <laughs> is on the table. And if by copycat, you mean like sharing the approaches, like, I think, nothing about this is proprietary in the sense that if every state could take this uh, approach we've been playing with in Utah, New Hampshire and replicate it, we would be thrilled. So um, so, so that type of copycat is um, is highly encouraged. But no, I mean, I think in general, what what we when, what we found when we talked with clinicians um, and this was part of my dissertation work, like many were very fearful about bringing up guns for two reasons. One is um, they were concerned about, you know, planting the idea. And it turns out that there's actually a pretty rich research base on, um, I, uh, I can never say this word, iatrogenic, so anyone who's a psychiatrist, basically an idea being planted in someone's mind that changes their behavior. It turns out that with suicide and with gun suicide, that there's not evidence that that occurs. So bringing it up will not cause someone um, to, uh, to want to kill themselves. Um, the other reason clinicians were hesitant is because they just like, why do I need to bring up a politically sensitive topic with someone? Uh, aren't they, isn't that just going to make this like awkward? Um, and my answer to that was like, generally, no, if you bring it up in a sensitive way and using language that's respectful, just as hopefully clinicians are talking about sexual health and, you know, doing pelvic exams, like there are things you do in clinical practice that aren't Fun and may even be awkward at times, but you do them anyway because they hopefully help um, increase the health of your patients. So with a little conversation, most clinicians were able to get over that hump. But I do think the two language things I would advise is, um, you know, not sharing details about guns versus sharps. We'd obviously prefer if someone's going to make an attempt to do so with, the least, uh, with a much less lethal method. And then the other is like just being sensitive to language. And there's lots of trainings out there about not talking about, you know, um, gun grabbing or using terms like, like even the term gun violence, I usually avoid because it's kind of been uh, seen by gun owners as being um, anti-gun, instead using gun safety or, um, uh, you know, other options. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, so, um, I will take a, a moderator privilege and ask one. And that's that we've seen um, changes in, in who is buying guns, especially since 2020. We've seen uh, rises in, in particular of women in purchasing weapons um, and in black and brown communities. And I'm just wondering if you um, have any thoughts about how you might take this approach and, and apply it to different communities or if you, seen places where it hasn't worked well or maybe where it has worked well as um, the as the diversity of gun owners um, changes? Yeah, no, I think it's a key question and it's not one I have um, any perfect answer to. I mean, I will just anecdotally say that, um, so I was living in Salt Lake City at the, when everything shut down uh, at the beginning of COVID. And Salt Lake City actually also suffered a um, magnitude six or so earthquake on, I think it was like a few weeks in to March 20. So there was this really like high sense of instability, and I, I was um, 
going down the street on a walk one day and just like the line out the gun shop um, in downtown Salt Lake was quite um, stirring and it led to some conversations. Um, and basically the way that we approached it, so we did a few different things in early COVID as we saw both locally and nationally that gun sales and ammunition sales were way up. The main approach we took, and again, without we didn't evaluate it, so I can't say how much it worked, um, was that we just talked about the idea of risk and how um, how do you as a how do you balance the risks and the fears that you experience in a home? Um, for some of us, like the the fears, the the relative risk of having a gun, especially if we have children or people who are um, going through a difficult time psychologically, is much um, is is a much higher risk than the fear of um, a home invasion or whatever you know. Uh, violence that we expect. And so I think having that conversation, and we we did a couple of Facebook lives at the beginning of COVID around this, like as your family is setting up its habits for God knows how long this will be, um, how are you thinking about risk? Are we, you know, clearly our decisions to Lysol every surface changed quickly as we came to know the time we were in. So as a gun owner, how do you think through, okay, maybe I want to own more guns because it's kind of an interesting time to collect them, but maybe I also need to be investing in aspects of safety and locking and being extra um, cognizant of that. As one gun owner, gun owner told me, I used to just put the gun on top of my fridge when I came home. And uh, I realized during COVID with our whole family home, like that was not going to be safe. And so it wasn't necessarily about removing the guns from his home as much as it was making sure everyone was locked up without um, access to ammunition. So that was how we thought about it at the time. Wonderful. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. If anyone um, has one, I'm not seeing one pop in the chat. I'm not seeing anyone come on. Um, Dr. Hen, oh, here comes my five-year-old. <laughs> well, I was hoping you'd show up. Um, we're home with a sick kid, everyone, and so it's super fun. It's just like COVID. Um, is there anything you would like to say in conclusion? And I am gonna like officially mute. I think for the rest of our time. Yeah. No, just thank you so much. It's um, it's such a privilege uh, to step back and think about these things. I think Inchip is doing something so right in taking a very multidisciplinary look at complex challenges. And um, and I think the last thing I'll leave you with is I'm really interested in exploring and collaborating with people who are thinking about common ground and um, fuller participation across the health and human services. So I've been thinking a lot about families in our child welfare system. How do we, um, how do we not inadvertently leave people out who we very much want to reach and, and serve through um, progressive public health approaches? So, so that's something that maybe someday we'll be, um, have more data to share, but I think when we think about the big public health issues of today, um, how can we be more inclusive and more bridge building? Thank you so much, though, for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you so much, and thank you to everyone for joining us.